Welcome back to our ongoing series, The Intersection of Innovation and Technology with Art. Uh, we have music on our minds these days. We are in the midst of our really exciting uh, promotional opportunity. It's the CES 2016 Music Contest. Uh, we are letting anyone and everyone enter for the possibility of having your original music used for our CES in January in Vegas. Um, all you need to do to get more information is go to our site at www.cesweb.org backslash soundtrack to learn the rules and you have until September 1st to submit your submission. Without further ado, uh, I'm really excited today. Uh, we've had a, a bunch of musicians on this series talking about technology and, and how it impacts their lives. Uh, today, we have the honor of chatting with Adam Dorn who may be better known to many of you as his musical alias, Motion Worker. And he is uh, a brilliant musician in his own right, son of legendary jazz producer, Joel Dorn, who happens to be a personal hero. So there's a, a lot of uh, personal pleasure I take from this opportunity. Um, Adam has really navigated this whole sphere of what we would call kind of the modern crazy world of how technology interacts with music as a musician. Um, Adam, I, I'm happy to welcome you on. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, how you come from a musical scene, and how you parlay that into what you do now. Well, okay, look, so I'll back it up a little bit. Thanks for the kind words about my father. That's really awesome. Um, I grew up in a very musical household, and, you know, the, the way I kind of break it down is that my father, you know, if anybody saw the movie High Fidelity, if you remember the John Cusack film, there was this series of dream jobs, and he was dream job number two was actually my father. He was a staff producer at Atlantic Records from 1964 to 1973, and then you know he went on to be more of an independent record producer outside of the major label system. And actually, that move from the mid 70s on informed my career tremendously, uh, which was basically growing up in that household surrounded by musicians, surrounded by artists and singers and, and even film directors and, and, you know, photographers, people of, you know, technical and artistic ability, you know, all, all across the board. M my father basically was like, listen, you're a musician right now, but coming in the future, things are going to really change and things are going to, you know, computers are going to change everything. And, you know, I really wanted to make sure that I focused on, you know, adapt. I'm sorry, my dog is walking in and he's just... walking up to me. Mookie, out. Um, <laughs> that's great. So, um, you know, I really wanted to adapt to the way that technology changed the record business. And, you know, so growing up in that environment and seeing how, tech, listen, when disco came in, mm -hmm. that changed every record producer my father knew. It changed his career. Uh, you know, machines really got a lot of musicians out of work. So I kind of knew when I was starting to play bass and I was starting to work, I started working really early as a musician. By, by 16, I was working professionally. Um, I knew to save up and buy drum machines and samplers and computers and, you know, really go that route. So, you know, it's funny, like the technology has formed my career and my career path as much as the knowledge of, of actual musicianship and, and the music. They've gone hand in hand the whole time. And, and oddly enough, my father, who upon being given a laptop as a gift, um, basically said, hold on, uh, how do you turn this thing on? And, and I was like, uh, this is going to be, this is going to take a minute. He never adapted to technology and he never embraced it. He thought it was annoying to be quite honest. So like, we're, you know, I'm the polar opposite. I, I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with it, but well, so but yeah, he, he was the, he, I mean, he was the oldest of schools in, in, in yeah. so many great ways. But what yeah. I, what I really find fascinating about you kind of as a case study, Adam, is that you are, you know, in, in tech speak, you, you were an early adopter. You, yeah. you're a tech geek. But you're yeah. also an incredibly creative musician. And what we found both in this series and and I, I see in my own, you know, kind of daily life is usually those two don't interact. We usually right. have the tech geeks explaining to the creative types. So in a sense, you're really the first person we've had 
that is extremely proficient in both worlds. Um, cool. And so as, as it happened, you know, you were really setting yourself up for the future. And I think that's something we can kind of hone in on here while, while we talk. Like sure. yeah. how that really, what, what, what that's meant. I mean, I think everyone can understand and appreciate and, and, and envy, speaking for myself, the idea of really being comfortable and having the smarts to understand, I need to navigate this world before I'm, I'm unable to navigate it, which is where I think a lot of our brethren find yeah. themselves right now. But even in the last, you know, 15 years, even in the last five years, things have changed dramatically, but maybe you can walk us through, you know, like the 2000s and how you're the, how you've kind of began your career with the advantages you had uh, knowing these things, but also what's the learning curve like to keep up with all this technology? Uh, okay. So you, the, the, the perfect timeline is 15 years because that's basically the run of off by like maybe one or two years of my sort of arc as a, as a solo artist. And, you know, this will sound strange, but a lot of times you, and I know this might sound like contrived, but failure informs you so often in a career in creativity. And I, one of the main aspects of why I, I think I pivoted and I changed directions really hard in about 2003 was I had a quote unquote sort of like major label deal with a gentleman uh, named Chris Blackwell, and he's really famous for being the, you know, he discovered Bob Marley and U2, yep. and he ran Island, Island Records, Records, and yep. right, he had another venture, uh, an A&R guy approached me uh, to sign with the label, and my second and third records are with the label, and I would say every aspect of signing that deal and going through that process as a signed artist informed me that I didn't belong in that building, I didn't. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of like, you know, the kid that doesn't play well in the sandbox. Like, I was just like, this ain't working out. And this is not the focus I want on my creativity as an artist. Mm -hmm. And, and it, in, in a lot of ways, the music reached a lot of people, but the, the albums I made while I was there, I view as sort of successful failures. Okay. Um, I didn't fit into a label construct and I didn't fit into their wants and wishes. I will say this. Chris Blackwell is an amazing human being, and he gave me back my fourth record, which is called Enter the Movo, which really was the record that set up my entire thing. And so I, I actually will say without any hesitation, I kind of love him for that because he basically was like, you don't fit in here. We're not really moving forward. And I think there's something here that you can do moving forward that will help yourself. And that record sold I'd be, I think about six or seven times more than any record prior to it. And it was the birth of like the sound I was trying to go for. And what I did was I just took some shots. You know, it was the birth of the iTunes store. And I have to say of all the technology companies out there right now, and I don't want to alienate any of your members, but I, I think Apple is the most, they are the, they are the most clear with their goals and they are the most supportive of artists. They have, if it wasn't for the iTunes store, I would think about over the course of the 10, 11 years of its existence, 35 to $40 billion has been pumped into the record business sort of revenue stream. If, if the iTunes legal download store didn't exist, my career wouldn't be what it is right now. Um, they helped me tremendously, and I'm a huge supporter of iTunes and Apple and, and their endeavors. So, you know, I, I really embraced the the legal download store and the fact that the internet was not only the future but it was already happening and it needed to be like embraced fully there were hiccups you know uh rhymes with myspace music <laughs> you know <laughs> friend, friends that, you know what i mean like there were definitely yeah. these weird things where you're like well, what's going on and what is you know, I'm getting ready to release a record in about three weeks, and I have to say this has been the easiest setup process because of technology for a record I've ever had. And, you know, it, it's an incredible experience to be able to master a record within a day, have it ready for digital di distribution within two days, have the artwork sort of sent out worldwide and ready, ready for different labels all over the world to use, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, I, I, I hate to, I'm, I'm sort of digressing in a little way. I think these conversations tend to go this way, you know, because sure. things pop into my mind. But sure. I, I think that as an artist, 
you know, if you're listening to this and you're seeing this, you know, your ability to sort of, you know, take advantage of all things technology is incredible. You have to also be ready to accept that certain things won't work and you learn from why things don't work. You know, a lot of people complain and one about streaming revenues suck and this company's doing this and blah, blah, blah. You know, lots of things before streaming sucked <laughs> in the record business. You know, artists haven't always been treated fairly. I didn't feel I was treated fairly in my label deal. Right. But then a set of circumstances came to pass where I took advantage of some opportunities because of some, actually because of some failure. You know, failure isn't the worst thing in the world. And I know that sounds so weird, but it's mm -hmm. like, you know, I don't know. I, I worked with Brian Eno uh, in 1999 on a film score. And, you know, I know that like saying Brian Eno, it's like you're invoking some deity in music. And especially regarding, Sean, what you just brought up, the marriage of technology and actual music ability mm -hmm. in, in such an incredible way. And what I learned from Brian Eno was, you know what? Just keep coming up with ideas. They're not all going to be brilliant, but just keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, and that's what I say to anybody in this new sort of digital age. You have an ability to constantly release. I hate calling music content. That that's, <laughs> It freaks me out. But yeah. you have this ability to use these tools to constantly inform and, and get your listeners engaged and listening to your music. So, you know, just take advantage of it. Listen, I, I, I second all that and appreciate that. That. that genuine insight based on experience. I think, you know, we could go in a lot of directions with that whole topic. One of the things that I've done on this series, because, you know, as a writer that's done a lot of DIY and and, and embraced a lot of technology for kind of independent uh, distribution, what we've talked about in this series a lot is the democratization of content and how companies yeah. like Apple helped democratize and, and tame what was really a wild, wild west. And as we funnel through kind of what was at once, you know, a really wide open, uh, boundaryless potential future. Now the the parameters are, are more defined. But I think the tough love that some of these aspiring musicians and writers and, and content creators need to understand is one, the future is already happening. So you have oh, yeah. to you don't have to you don't have to fall in line, but you have to accept the inevitable. But secondly, to your point about putting content out there, it really is it's incumbent upon the individual to find ways to navigate what makes sense for them, but recognize right. that some of it is just, I think, an old school fear and laziness of, I want someone to hold my hand and do all the dirty work. I think the people that have an advantage now, you don't have to be a tech geek to, to you know navigate a lot of this terrain, but you no. do have to be willing to learn as you go. And, and I think to your point, not only make mistakes and realize that they're inevitable, but embrace the fact that the mistakes might lead to things that you didn't even imagine. Right, you know, they, they lead to a lot of opportunities that you didn't think would come up. You know, it's like, I always use the analogy, like you kind of have to be like a boxer and the best boxers always adjust. You know what I mean? You don't, uh, I, I forget the term in boxing, but it's like, don't show what you're about to throw, react to what's coming to you. And then, you know, that's, that's where your opportunities are created as a fighter, you know. For me, you know, currently what's going on and I, you know, I'd like to use this sort of forum as, as one thing for musicians to understand a couple things about the way the technology isn't always very helpful, is that there are a lot of services right now that disseminate music that don't necessarily fairly compensate the artists. And I think there's a lot of weird press about what actually gets done with the revenues of music. You know, streaming is amazing. Streaming isn't going anywhere. If you're, if you're an artist, Sign up with Sound Exchange. I hope I, I'm allowed to mention something like this, uh, you know, through this, um, and and make sure that your content is known uh, and can be followed online. You know, there are a lot of things going on in Washington D.C. right now. I'm part I'm part of an organization in Los Angeles called SONA, it's Songwriters of North America. You know, and we're fighting for the rights of songwriters to so, so you know people don't understand. They see a massive hit. It gets 200 million streams on YouTube, and you know what? The songwriters don't get paid. And the only reason why I'm bringing this up is that while we're in this period that you just brought up, Sean, of like, you know, listen, the, the ship has left the docks, but, you know, while on board, you can still adjust some things. And we're in an adjustment period. I think we're about three to five years out where you go from physical media into 
you know, maybe through Apple Music and Spotify and then maybe Pandora. I don't know if they're going to be here for the fun bus, but, you know, um, you, you get 150, 200 million people worldwide to sign up for the fact that music is a subscription and then things change. We are not there yet, but mm -hmm. we're going to be there. And this is the time where if you're a creative and you're savvy with technology and you're really creative, you slog through and you hope that in D.C., songwriters get the fair compensation for the you know dissemination of their you know content online streaming rates will go up with subscription rates there's a lot of voodoo and strange laws going that that exist that don't allow for certain things and i think the number one thing about being a tech geek is you also kind of have to be a law geek and you have to understand while you're being creative you have to understand what your rights are as an artist why you get paid certain amounts and why certain services pay certain rates and what enables them to do so. Like, don't demonize a, a service like Spotify because they can pay 0. 0.00007 cents per stream to a songwriter. Affect that change in DC. That, that's what Sona's is trying to do. I, I don't want to use this as a soapbox, but I, you know, I, I, I definitely think that, you know, all of this communication and connectivity worldwide also means that you can educate yourself. And you can read up on why things work a certain way and while you're also creating content. Unfortunately, as creatives now, we are charged with this responsibility to not only write songs, but <laughs> produce them, mix them, master them, do the artwork. You know, like you just you just brought a lot on your plate because you no longer have a label to do it for you. But you also and what I want to say about that is people demonize labels. But when you would get an advance from a label, that was an 88% loan that you were being given most of the time if you had 12% of the revenue. That's like a credit card bill that is completely <laughs> unpayable. So, you know, you have these things. It's like a balloon. You squeeze it, and certain things are in your favor now, and certain things, I'm sorry, they're really hard, and there's a lot of moving parts that you have to adjust to. Um, and well, and I think I think that's for me one of the key takeaways is that the future, by virtue of of not having happened yet, even if we can see what's coming, mm. hasn't happened, and things have a, a a habit of changing overnight. So I, I think where we have some some discernible kind of lines in the sand, we don't know where the the industry is going to be in five years, and we don't know how how much better. I think what we do see over and over again is that technology and innovation are always making it easier and more affordable for content to get created and yes. then disseminated. And yes. I think what, what, what creative people need to understand, and in, in addition to your uh, points, is that for all the challenges and, and a lot of the things that you have to navigate out there, I think the simple reality is it's never been easier to own your own material and find a way to get that material to a large group of people. And I think pre-internet, that was something you'd see in a science fiction novel and say, wow, I, I really yeah. wish that some mechanism, some magic mechanism existed where I could reach people in different languages and, and talk to them. And the reality is the internet does make that happen. Yeah, no, it, very much so. And now, you know, it's like, like I was saying, I'm setting up this record that's coming out on the 18th of August and it's going to every single digital download store on the planet, simultaneous release. I mean, I used to release records and it would be like, oh, it's coming out in England in three months. <laughs> oh, it's not going to be available in Germany ever. You know, like if you want to get it, you have to get it as an import. You know, now everything is the same day. Everything is like literally, I think my distributor charges me 49 bucks to, to distribute worldwide. You know what I mean? It's, it's, yeah. it's kind of ridiculous. So it's like, well, all right, that used to be something that cost like tens of thousands of dollars in production costs and manufacturing costs. And then, you know, you know, mastering the record used to cost $3,000. I think I mastered my record for $400. And when I spoke to the mastering house and, and what that is, is that's the final EQ process of, mm -hmm. of making a record. So everything is balanced and sounds like it's part of one thought. Um, they were like, we've never had more work in our lives. And that's because worldwide, this specific mastering house is being reached through their Facebook page. Right. So, uh, you know, it's like, come on, you know, like you can't, you, it can't be, it's, it, it's never, okay. There's one thing I will say. It's never been easier to make music, mm -hmm. but as a result, there's never been 
There's never been more music available ever, but there's never been more bad music available right. ever. So, so there, there is a little bit of the magic of the old days was, hey, you got a contract, you had three albums or four albums to develop. Now it's just like, hi, I made a record and then my cousin wants me to put it out. Like, it's a little, there's a little too much to slog through. So I think that's where, you know, photography has had this happen. Mm -hmm. Publishing has had this happen. You know, music has had this happen. I think we're in a period where everybody thinks, you know, it's like, what's the old joke? Everybody's a DJ, you know, and everybody wants to direct, you know, it's like right. everybody can right now. But I think in a couple of years, there will be people that pop up that are amazing and they come out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And the labels, major labels, they're going to find out if they really want to stay vital and they really want to stay in business, they're going to have to mirror the film studios of the early 70s and they're going to have to start really creatively developing talent again because the world will not just sit by and have Ariana Grande be the benchmark for what you... You know, like that can't be it. And I hate to use her as an example, but I love to use her as an example because right. major labels right now are doing the same thing that major film studios are doing. They're saying we have a comic book and we're going to make six of these movies and spend a billion and a half dollars. And mm -hmm. you know what? That's not a sustainable model moving forward because if you have two failures, you're That's out right. of business. That's you know right. what I mean? So I, I, the, the main thing with music moving forward, and it's funny, I have a really good friend, a record producer named Michael Beinhorn, and we talked about this the other day, and he brought up such, such an amazing point. He said, the number one thing moving forward is the fostering of, of art and, and, and talent. You don't, music dies if you just focus on these disposable things. Mm -hmm. Like, it just, it will. Um, so people are going to be yearning. That's why when D'Angelo releases a record, and, and he hasn't had one in 15 years, people go nuts. Or when Adele puts out a record, they're finally hearing something they love. Taylor Swift, as much as she's sort of, you know, like, sort of like made fun of, her record is amazing and sold 5 million records That's for right. a reason. That's right. Because it's actually good. It, so, it, you know... And I and I think that's you know to and this, this has come up in the series certainly in, in the past but to me I'm very bullish on the the future of creativity in the for the simple reason that just because everyone literally can write a book or make a movie or make an album at a certain point quality will rise and and certainly kind of online curation the tastemakers now aren't necessarily a handful of magazines that have prominent you know reviews now a, a blogger with a sufficient following or a facebook page or these communities that spring up within social media can help like-minded people get steered toward quality work so i i think again it's a very empowering mechanism where you you can rely on the wisdom of the crowds but the crowds happen to be people like you or people that know music that know people that are making music and, and in that regard what can be kind of an overwhelming phenomenon i find it to be very logical and, and very human there's a lot of soul in yeah. the internet of people curating and and helping promote in a very holistic way that doesn't have anything to do with bottom lines yeah and you know what? It's like there's going to be that small hand, like just like handful of people that maybe they bust out and they become like pretty powerful. You know, it's like, you know, you saw Huffington Post start and now Huffington Post is like this. It's this de facto ubiquitous thing. Mm -hmm. You know, there are going to be, you know, especially within music, a handful of people that are independent of major labels, independent of, you know, like really big entities that sort of dictate what you should and shouldn't be listening to. I think that uh, it's going to be interesting in the next couple of years who sort of becomes that. We do live in a very sort of TMZ culture, and, I, I, and I'm a little afraid of how some of that moving forward. The, the bandwidth seemed it, to use it, you know, it's in, in a non-technological way, use the technology term. The bandwidth is narrow on the sort of major pop level. Like, it's kind of like the same six songs over and over again. It's going to be interesting to see when there's a tilt in that and sort of bands come back and, uh, you know, certain kinds of artists pop out where it's like, yeah, she's not like gorgeous and singing bubblegum pop. It's like, you know what I mean? Like the, it's going to be interesting to see how music moves forward and how certain artists, like I'd love another Beatles or Nirvana or Hendrix or something where it's that sea change moment where you're like, whoa, that's, that's a major artist that's like, you know, inspiring 
thousands of other artists to move in a specific direction. We haven't had that kind of artist in a while. We really haven't. And I almost wonder if that's because the pipeline is clogged with product. You know, like, yeah. it, think about it, man. Like, when we were kids, uh, you know, there was a rock section. There was a, you know, R&B, soul, jazz. Like, things were, you know, things popped out of different genres. Now everything is sort of like, Hip hop, R and B, house music, electronica, EDM, pop singer. You know, like it, it's all like, okay, we need it to divide a little. You know, I'd love a big metal act right now. <laughs> That'd be cool. Well, and you know, for the people that are really nostalgic to the point of romanticizing the past, I think you know when I think about the future and what you're talking about, the reality is there there's maybe room for only one Hendrix or Nirvana per generation, but there there was a certain amount of fortuitous happenstance and luck involved. Whereas now, at least we will know that when some of these people emerge out of out of the wilderness, it wasn't because somebody knew somebody and they got signed to a major label. At least the potential is there for a relative novice that doesn't need connections to to get that voice heard. It's just a matter of, of making content that is sufficiently irresistible that people can't ignore it. Yeah, and, and it, you know, in certain ways, it's it's already kind of happening. It's just that sort of era defining artist hasn't really popped out yet mm -hmm. but like you know it is kind of cool that like a korean guy makes gangnam style it's like 2.4 billion views and it's essentially a song making fun of pop culture that's the number one pop song of this generation so you know that it, it, who, who would have guessed that you know 10 years ago a korean song a korean language piece of music being the biggest thing of a decade you would never have guessed that. So it is those kinds of things. Where is it coming from? You just don't know. Right. You know? Well, I've got my money on a soon to be yeah. released, a soon to be released album that is entitled <laughs> It's Pronounced Motion is August. No, 18th, no, it's, that's, oh, I'm sorry, man. No, oh, that's it's it's called it's just soft titled. It's motion worker. It's pronounced motion. That's that was a record I did for Japan. Um ah. motion work. That's well, okay. I want to. I want to have that moment. I want to have that moment. Like that what, tell us what it's called. The date is coming out. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, man. So I had to. I had to interrupt. Um, it's called Motion Worker. It's self-titled. It's actually my eighth album, and it's coming out August eighteenth worldwide, digital only. So you can you just go and stream it, and you know if you want to buy it, download it. But uh, I am not ruining any more forests for CDs, uh, and, and you know uh, at least for the time being. Right. Um, and it, yeah, it's just it's 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 a it's a cool record. I think fans of my music will really love it because it's a continuation of a thought, but it's really funky. This record is far more organic than the last couple records. It's it's different. But yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, I think you you it's got that great. from my email. Yeah. Oh. I mean, well, again, but there's there's the beauty of, of technology, right? If this was a printed story, it would have been out there and Done. ruined yeah. trees that we can print it in real time. <laughs> So Perfect, I'm looking forward to hearing it. I really appreciate having you on. We'd love to have you back sometime to Absolutely. see what we'll, we'll talk about the reception and, and how that goes and lessons okay. learned from this. And uh, maybe we'll see you out at CES this year. Oh, that would be a, that would be a first for me. I'd like to finally go. I've never been. So be to great. be continued. And uh, once again, everybody, we, we're really excited right now about our CES 2016 music contest that website again go check out the rules and regulations and submit your uh entry www.cesweb.org backslash soundtrack and we'll see you on here again soon with another conversation